So I'm going to go to rewind. You know, when I was growing up, we used to have tape recorders and they were wonderful things. You press that button and it went right back. So I'm going to start all over again. Hello, everybody. Hello. And my topic for today is slightly controversial, but interesting nevertheless. And I'm going to be talking about breaking stereotypes. Okay? Here I am in a frame, and the frame is great. There are barriers, there are walls, and I am safe. I am safe as long as I stay within my boundary. Everything is going to be fine. And what is going to be fine? The neighbors will be happy. Society will be very happy. My parents will breathe a sigh of relief and life will go on provided I stay within the frame. But now let me move out of the frame. Oops! What has she done? What is she doing? How could she break convention? How could she break stereotype? Oh my God, log kya kahenge? Mar gaye hum log, my God. See, what are we going to do? But you see, I was in the frame. And I got bored. So what did I do? I stepped out of the frame. And I say to all of you, my friends, history was invented when man or woman asked two things. Why? And why not? In an era where the world was considered square, Christopher Columbus was told, don't go to the end of the ocean, you're going to fall off. Christopher Columbus said, really? Let's give it a shot. So he got into his ship and he sailed and he sailed right along. And as he sailed, he found that he didn't fall off. And that is how all of us discovered that the world was round. Another example, General Patton in the middle of a war had been told that the enemies are coming from the north. He got his entire army with guns, cannons, bombs, rifles, cavalry, and everybody was in position and aiming at the north. What happened? One of his cadets comes and says, General, General, they're not in the north. They're everywhere. Oops. But General Patton, without blinking an eye, said, Terrific young man, we shall attack from all sides. And this is what I want to talk to you about. I'm going to take you back to a chapter in my life. I lived in the foothills of the Himalayas in a little town many years ago. In those years, Nenital was a very sleepy, lazy little town. Nothing much happened. But convention was observed. Stereotype was the norm. And you stayed within your boundaries. Everybody did. Everybody did. But you see, in Nenital was this little girl called Sharon Prabhakar who said, why? Is this, is this the meaning of life? You get up, you work, you study, you come home, you have dinner, you go to sleep, and then the next morning the whole thing starts again. At this stage of my life, I'm able to analyze what I was feeling in those days because there's intellect and inner vision and your inner voice speaking to you. In those days, I was just angry. I was angry and dissatisfied. And I tell you, my friends, that was the making of me. I come from a family where many days there was no food to eat. 
My mother did her best to look after all of us. And enough was never enough. But you know, she had settled in to a life of acceptance. And it is this acceptance that was the making of me. And I tell you, my friends, till today, I am not going to accept what destiny dishes out to me. I will dish to destiny. I am in charge of my life. I am taking charge. I will take decisions. I am not going to follow norms. So sitting there in Nenital, I decided, I want to become a singer. Wow, unheard of in those days. Absolutely unheard of in those days. But it's a funny thing, you know. Funny? funny? I will require a bit of silence. But it's a funny thing, you know. The minute, the second you conspire or aspire to do something, whatever it is, run the extra mile, get 100 on 100 in your exam, or be the best neighbor or daughter or son or student, whatever it is, if you seriously are serious about your goals, your goals will become serious about you. And suddenly, mystically and magically, circumstance, opportunity, situations, and events start lining themselves up, saying, you know, there's that crazy woman out in Nenital. We've got to help her. So there I was with absolutely no money. I land in Delhi. And I've got my dream in front of me. I made my dream my best friend. Every day I look at the dream and I'd say, hi, dream. We got this. In the night, I'd say, sleep well, sweetheart. Sleep well. I'll see you in the morning. I made, my dream was synonymous with me. I never let sight of my dream, let go sight of my dream. But a mad thing happened. I was struck in Delhi at the age of about 17. I was, I'd left Nenital, I was now in Delhi. And I got ill. I got ill. And out of all the illnesses that there are in the world, here was I wanting to become a singer, I get an illness of the throat. With no money, no access to hospitals, my mother, of course, rushed down, took me to the latest, to the, you know, the, the nearby chemist. And they said, Madam, you're going to be very sick. The My parents didn't have money. So they brought me home, and I was just, I was just lying on the bed, thinking, hmm, this is a bit of a roadblock, isn't it? My voice, my throat, my vocal cords. Three months later, no progress at all. So my parents again took me to the, lo the, the local dispensary, as we used to call it in those days. And she said, do something, save her life. And when we had gone for the first visit, they did tell me that there was a disease that was choking my lungs and that I would eventually, if treatment was not given to me, I would die. But because we didn't have the money, my parents had resigned themselves to the fact that this was status quo. So for three months, I just lay at home and my father, in his typical resigned way, said, Beta, ye bhagwan ki ichha hai. And I had, they had accepted my fate. Three months later, my mother again takes me to the, to the dispensary and she said, do anything. So literally, literally, you're going to really have to hang on to your seats to hear this. They ripped my throat from inside and just a lot of the illness poured out. I came home, great pain, it all settled down, I'm going to do this very quickly. And I found that I wasn't able to speak. I thought one week, 10 days, 20 days, 30 days, whatever. And uh, back we went to the dispensary. They said, Madam, aapki beti ke mein we've got good news and we've got bad news. The good news is we told her she, you were, she was going to die. She's not going to die. The bad news, however, is her vocal cords are damaged and she's not going to have a voice ever. But you know me. I'm a fighter. 
That day again I talked to my dreams. I said, are you crazy? It's you and me against the world. And my dreams told me, sure. And I fought, and I fought, and I'm going to jump very quickly. And I did eventually get my voice back. And I said, not, a, not only am I going to be a singer, I'm going to be a great singer, I'm going to impact society, blah, blah, blah. My dreams had by then manifested while I was sick and technically I should have weakened and broken and settled down to getting, you know, married or whatever. I was, man, I was raring to go. So I arrived in Bombay. I have to tell you very quickly, I was planning to run away, but I told you about how the universe protects you. I happened to write a letter to my, one of my school teachers and I said, Mrs. Bhatti, I'm planning to run away. She said, don't be stupid, you don't have to run away, you come and stay with me. And so I stayed with her, then I started going around for auditions, for little radio jingles. I don't think they had TV in those days, I'm not sure, but I never saw a TV. Maybe it was with very rich people. And somebody heard that radio uh, commercial and they said, would you like to do some nursery rhymes? I sang those nursery rhymes. Somebody then rings me up and says, we want you to sing in a film. I'd never, A, sung in a film, and B, the studios, because I was living in, North, uh, in South Bombay, the studios are in, in, in North Bombay. And I actually said, sir, I'd love to sing your song, but I don't have any money for transport. So the money was, they said, don't worry, just get into a taxi and, you know, we, we'll see you at the studio. And again, I sang the song, and unbelievably, that song, which now I look and I, I cringe and I say, oh my God, my pitch is a little bit here and there, and I hopefully sing better now than I used to. But the song won the Song of the Year award, and then after that, there was no turning back. Life continued to be adventures and misadventures, but I was on my path. So here's the deal, my friends. Talking about boundary lines. I don't understand. When a baby cries, When you laugh, they say, don't laugh too much, drink water, you'll fall sick. And then you go to school. And in school you study a syllabus and you follow a system. And then you get into college. And you study a syllabus and you follow the system. And after that, you start looking for a job. And you research a, a path. And again, you follow the system. And one day, you wake up saying, hmm, this is life. Is this all there was? Was this my dream? Am I living a life of passion, excitement, enthusiasm, inspiration? Am I a light that is radiating out to people? Do people draw towards me because I've got something extra to tell them and share, share with them? And your inner voice says, no. <coughs> but you're okay. You're okay. For me, okay is a death sentence. But your brain comforts you and it lulls you into sublimation. For those who don't break conventional and stereotype thinking, your brain lulls you into submission. And I'm sorry to say this, my friends. You live, you die. Big deal. And that's all it's going to be. So here's the thing. Genetically, scientifically, biologically, each of us, you and I, we are unique. Do you know that? Have any of you bothered to think how unique you are? I'll tell you how unique you are. There never was, there isn't, and there is never going to be another you or another you. We are each such an amazing species. My question is, we should be jumping and saying hip hip hooray every two seconds. But are we? No. We are bogged down by the parameters that block us in. And I know it's a 
tough world out there. Hey, who said it was going to be easy? It's tough enough with the parameters. In my case, it was tough because there were no parameters. There is no handbook when you decide that you're going to achieve excellence. There is no guideline. There is nobody out there saying, oh, you want to achieve your goal? I'll take you along. Sorry. Lotteries in one in a hundred million get a lottery. But, you know, for us, everyday people, you got to figure it out by yourself. So here it is. We are unique. There never was and there is never going to be another me. So from today, while I salute all of you in the audience, and I salute heads of institutions who are coping with more than they can cope, you're all doing a commendable job. But ask yourself when you go back tonight to your homes, that in the course of your careers, could you have spotted a Tesla or an Einstein or maybe a Bill Gates or a Picasso had you stepped out of your box of systems and gone that little bit further? This is something that I really want you to think about. Just because you're living does not mean you have a life. There is a difference. There is a huge difference between living and having a life. And the time to start is now. Listen to your heart, my friends. Your heart's got all the answers. I'll tell you that. It's as simple as that. Your heart will tell you, I'm going to put a spin on this. I'm going to go the extra mile. You know where the danger lies? Is your brain. Your brain is your best friend. It's your gang who has that coffee where we chill and we hang and we say, you know what, everything's okay. Sab theek ho jayega. Don't worry. That person talked to you rudely? Avoid him or her. You got an exam in a week's time? He can you do it last minute. The brain is your friend and therein lies the danger. Don't make friends with your brain. Love what you do, but do what you hate. Push yourself, because I'm going to tell you something. Nobody's going to push for you. Go for excellence. There is a lot of room at the top. How come? One Apple inventor, one electricity inventor, couple of lead scientists, a couple of people have bro broken genetic codes. There is space at the top. All you have to do is think it and make the impossible possible. And in closing, I would like to say, go where the angels fear to tread. You don't have infinite time. That's another beauty over here. We've got more of everything. We can get very fat, we can get very thin, we can grow our hair, we can change our diets, we can change jobs, we can see different films. You lose money, you can earn money, you don't have time. We think we have time, trust me, we don't. You do not have infinite time. So every minute that you live on this earth, I want you to go beyond the boundaries that have been preset and think and look beyond and look into the impossible and see what you can come up with. Question, ask why. You are a soul who is here on earth to have a fabulous, fabulous journey. And lastly, I would like to say no is a death sentence. But yes is the road all of you should be on. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much, ma'am.